Today we are starting the series of lectures on nephrology, especially pathology of the renal system. And we'll, we will start our discussion with the pathologies related with the glomerular injuries, right? Especially our topic will be around glomerulopathies. Glomerulopathies and glomerulonephritis, right? Before I really go into detail of glomerulonephritis or glomerulopathy, I want to introduce the concept that once you injure the glomerulus, whatever the mechanism of injury, whenever you injure the glomerulus, right, what is the clinical problem starting there? Is that right? Let me draw the basic structure of glomerulus. You know glomeruli are filtration unit in the kidney. Yeah. One kidney has how many glomeruli? Question goes to... Muhammad, oh, I think you have been counting that, mm -hmm. right? So he is right that one kidney has about 1.2 million nephrons, and together both kidneys may have two to two and a half millions nephron. So I'm, I'm not going to draw all of them. I will just draw one glomerulus, and the same principle will be applied to the rest of the glomeruli on the both kidney, right? So let's suppose that. This is glomerular capillary, right? Here the blood is coming from afferent arteriole. Here the blood is going out to efferent. Yes, please, efferent arteriole. And here is your glomerular basement, GBM, glomerular basement membrane. And here is your Bowman's capsule or urinary space right and here is connective tissue which is called mesangium what is that mesangium is that right now of course you know capillary is lined by which cells endothelial cells you have to be with me and this side of the basement membrane is lined by special type of cells. What are these cells? These are podocytes or epithelial cells. Right? These are visceral epithelial cells. And here in the Bowman space, these are parietal epithelial cells. And of course, now there is the beginning of proximal convoluted tubule and remaining nephron. Now, one thing which should be clear that when we are talking about the glomerular diseases, we must be very, very clear about that this filtration membrane. Because glomerular diseases alter the characteristics of these filtration membranes. Normally, it has three components endothelial cells, then there is glomerular basement membrane, and then there is epithelial cells, right? This endothelial cells, these are fenestrated cells. When we, when we say endothelial cells are fenestrated cells, it means that there are fenestrations present within the endothelial cells. What are fenestrations? Fenestrations are the pores, right? These endothelial cells are porous. These endothelial cells are porous. They are having fenestrations right and one fenestration for example this is one fenestration but there are thousands and thousands of fenestrations present in every endothelial cell this fenestration one fenestration has a size of about 70 to 100 nanometer is that right so this is the fenestration size opposed to that the size at this side, epithelial cells, there are filtration slit. You know, these two points between the epithelial cells, they are called filtration slits. Let me tell you how they are applied there. Can you give me your copy? Uh, can you give me your copy? Right. Let's suppose this is glomerular basement membrane, right? And this is podo site. I think it is congenitally defected. Now, this is podocyte. 
podocyte is applied under it. Is that right? Now, in between the podocytes, other podocyte and this podocyte, they will interdigitate their foot processes, right? So, what really happens that under the glomerular basement membrane, you have podocytes which are interdigitating like this, right? And with the fingertips, they are sticking with the glomerular basement membrane. Why I am saying that with the fingertips, they are sticking with the glomerular basement membrane because in some glomerular diseases, right, these molecules which are holding the podocyte with the glomerular basement membrane, these molecules become defective and podocytes fall away and of course that will be a tragedy. So what I am saying, the podocytes are just applied on the glomerular basement membrane on the Bowman capsule side and they are interdigitating process and where are the filtration slits? Filtration slits are the gaps between the interdigitations. For example, the, in between my fingers, you find there are gaps. These gaps, these gaps are called filtration slits. slits. So we can say the substances are allowed to pass through fenestrations here and eventually they have to pass through this filtration slits and until podocytes are properly applied on the basement membrane, there will be physiological filtration. But if podocytes or their foot processes, which, we, which I call fingertips or foot processes, technically speaking, foot processes of these cells, if they detach, then it will become more permeable. Now, the size of the filtration slit is about 20 to 30 nanometer. And this was, on endothelial cell, this was 70 to 100 nanometer. Now you know the barrier size here is size barrier 70 to 100 and here size barrier is 20. Is that clear? Now, another important point is that all the things which have to pass through that, they have to be small enough to pass through these barriers. Is that right? There is one more mechanism which also determines the barrier to the filtration. One barrier we have discussed the size barrier size at this point and size at this point. So size of these pores act as a barrier for filtration. There is one more mechanism of barrier. That barrier is negative charges. There are negative charges on this endothelial cell, there are negative charges on the glomerular basement membrane and there are negative charges on the epithelial cells. So we say there are many, many negatively charged molecules present on this filtration membrane at multiple levels. Now, these negative charges repel the negative molecules, negatively charged molecules. You know, plasma proteins are normally at physiological pH, plasma proteins are charged negatively. So, plasma proteins are repelled by these negative charges. So, any molecule or plasma protein or RBCs, WBCs or platelets or any substance which has to go down, it has to face the size barrier as well as charge barrier. Am I clear? Let me talk about especially albumin. The molecular size of the albumin is just enough to pass through the size barrier. Molecular size of the albumin, which is about 70 kilo delton, the molecular weight of the albumin, that is just enough to allow the albumin molecule to pass through these barriers due to their size. But normally albumin does not leak out. Why? Because albumin is negatively charged and these membranes are also negatively charged. So, albumin is repelled. Another explanation of this is there is a disease called minimal change glomerulopathy. In that disease, there is no big structural defect here. The real problem in that disease is that negative charges are neutralized. As soon as negative charges are neutralized, lot of albumin start leaking down. Whole this concept is clear? No problem. After this uh, barrier discussion, now we come to a uh, different patient with different degree of injury to glomeruli. Right? Now, if there is, let's suppose, there is very, very mild injury to this person due to any mechanism. Let's suppose due to some immunological mechanism, which I will discuss into detail later, there is a very mild injury. Suppose we can say, Grade 1 injury. Grade 1 is not a medical term. I'm just for explanatory purpose I'm saying that let's suppose someone has in his glomerulus 
very very minor injury when there's a very minor injury the smallest molecule will start leaking now the smallest molecule are albumins so what really happens here is your albumin here is your globulin here is your fibrinogen now what really happens that as soon as there's little injury albumin start coming down into urine and we say that there is albumin albumin urea right and because only albumin is selected to be leaky and globulin is not allowed to leak so we also call the situation either only albumin urea or we say patient has selective protein urea is that right when next time you come across a term selective protein urea it means that albumin is allowed to leak but the damage is not enough to allow the globulin to leak is that right so selective protein urea can is also a term which is used over selective protein urea right so with grade 1 injury right or plus 1 injury okay make it simple with plus 1 injury right which is very very mild injury you have only albumin leaking down now let's come across another patient in which injury to glomerular structure is more than the first case and if injury to glomerular structure is more than the first person let's suppose here is plus 2 injury it means membrane will become more more leaky and this time this patient will have not only albumin coming down but this patient will also have globulin coming down so albumin is there plus globulin is there right and this type of protein urea is called yes please it is called non selective protein urea right let me repeat it if there is very this plus one injury only albumin is allowed to leak but globulin will not leak but injury is slightly more than that then not only albumin will leak but with the albumin globulin will also leak and we say there is non selective protein urea and now we go to another person where injury is post plus 3 right now what will happen in this person where injury is more and pores are increased in number and increase in size significantly of course this person will have albumin urea but very heavy albumin plus this person will have globulin urea but far more than the second patient because injury is more so protein urea in the third patient right is more than the second patient and if albumin urea become more than 3.5 if protein urea of course it is selective protein urea or non selective protein urea this is non selective protein urea if this protein urea here is more than 3.5 grams per day or or it is more than 3.5 grams per 24 hour into urine right then further complications are starting right and this concept is very important the difference between patient number two and three patient number two has non-selective protein urea patient number three has also non-selective protein urea but here protein urea is less than 3.5 grams per 24 hour but in patient number 3 protein urea is more than 3.5 grams per day and once protein urea in urine in adult become more than 3.5 grams per day there is a major change in the whole clinical picture what is the change actually normally what happens that when there is let me make that this is your circulatory system right when there is protein urea proteins are being lost into urine right then this is the duty of the liver to compensate the proteins you know major source of plasma protein is liver hepatocytes are the synthetic machines right so as protein urea increases normally 
liver increases its synthesis of proteins so that it can compensate and maintain the reasonable level of plasma proteins in the blood now if protein urea become more than 3.5 grams per day then liver in spite of its full compensatory effort will not be able to maintain the plasma protein concentration at appropriate level what is the normal uh, per day production of proteins by the liver healthy liver can produce maximum how much proteins per day plasma proteins anyone attention please question is so simple that a normal healthy liver can produce when it is working at the maximum to compensate the urinary losses per day how much plasma protein it can really synthesize 78, 78 what grams per 78 grams per I think uh, you have some monsters liver <laughs> yes yes 3.5 he tried to be logical you know because yeah. he think that if 3.5 is lost or if loss is more than 3.5 grams and then hypolibuminemia develop it means liver cannot compensate so he logically thought out that it means liver cannot produce more than 3.5 grams per dr per day and there he is wrong medical science like life is not that simple liver can produce daily 10 to 12 grams per day proteins plasma proteins which can be produced by healthy liver 10 to 12 grams per day but whenever in the urine losses of more than 3.5 grams blood proteins levels start going down in spite of the full production and we say hypoproteinemia develops or hypolibuminemia develops what is this mystery that only 3.5 is coming into urine and it is able to contrib contribute up to 10 to 12 grams but patients start developing hypoproteinemia who will solve this mystery for me isn't it mysterious <laughs> that from your pocket 3.5 is dollars going per, per day out and you put 12 dollars daily but still your dollar level in the pocket is shrinking what is happening to your pocket <laughs> Yes, you have some idea? Well, maybe that's not only albumin that's making, it's making a lot of different proteins. No, uh, I'm right now concentrating about the plasma protein which are mainly albumin and globulin. And here the losses are albumin and globulin. Anyway, I appreciate the way you thought it. He thought that 10 to 12 grams mean it is making many proteins and out of them few are albumin and globulin. This is not the right uh, answer. The reason being 10 to 12 grams per day I am talking about plasma proteins especially albumin and globulin. I am not talking about other coagulation factors and other complement proteins and other proteins. Is that right? Mike, uh, the only now the problem mystery is that that someone who start losing more than 3.5 grams proteins per day into urine plasma protein levels start going down in spite of contributory synthesis of compensatory synthesis of 10 to 12 grams per liver if someone can answer fine otherwise I'm left with the answer most of the rest of the protein will be bound to all the molecules okay before you come up with the very new theory which no one knows let me explain right so actually the real loss from here is not 3.5 gram here are your friends proximal convoluted tubular cells and they love to eat up the proteins the proteins which are leaking down many of them by pinocytic process are taken up into these cells which cells cells of proximal convoluted tubule and lot of proteins lot of proteins are catabolized there so whenever extra proteins are lost from the blood to the Bowman space right only some proteins appear into urine and a lot is destroyed in the proximal convoluted tubule and this is the loss you are not concentrating on proximal convoluted tubules are concerned with the metabolism of rather catabolism of small molecular weight proteins is that right so naturally when there is no protein leakage 
no significant losses here, no significant catabolism here. But as soon as there is a disease which damages the glomerular structure, lot of proteins start leaking down. Maybe total protein is leaking 14 grams. Out of that 14 grams, maybe 5 grams come down here and 9 grams are destroyed here. Is that right? So basically, there are two types of losses of the proteins which are pathologically filtered from glomerular barrier into Bowman space. Some of the protein really appears into urine and some of the protein is catabolized in, in proximal convoluted tubule. Is that clear to everyone? Right? So what really happens, once there is a heavy protein urea, heavy protein urea is a term to be used when protein losses in the urine are more than 3.5 gram. When you have a heavy protein urea, then you start developing hypoalbuminemia. What do you start developing? Hypoproteinemia. Of course, plasma proteins will be less, albumin will be less and globulin will be less if it is non-selective protein losses. When plasma protein levels goes down, plasma proteins do lot of function. One of the very important function is the plasma proteins maintain the osmotic pressure or oncotic pressure within the circulatory system. Plasma proteins maintain the osmotic pressure within the circulatory system. Right? You know that hydrostatic pressure, for example, this is an artery, here is a capillary network and here is the vein. Now what really happens? Hydrostatic pressure is pushing the fluid out into interstitial area. Hydrostatic pressure is pushing the fluid out. And osmotic pressure exerted by the plasma protein is pulling the fluid in. Is that right? So, capillaries on their arterial end, capillaries, when they are on the arterial end, hydrostatic pressure is more. Hydrostatic pressure is more than the osmotic pressure of proteins. So, fluid leaks out. But as fluid, as blood moves from arterial end of the capillary to the venous end of the capillaries, hydrostatic pressure drop. And within the this part of the capillary, osmotic pressure is more than the hydrostatic pressure. So, fluid which has gone to interstitial area, it is sucked back. So, this is a normal mechanism that in every tissue, normally, constantly, from arterial side of the capillaries, fluid is leaking out, adding to interstitial fluid and fluid on the venous end of the capillaries, fluid is constantly taken back to the circulatory system due to high osmotic pressure. Again, listen. Osmotic pressure of protein in most of the capillaries is around 27 millimeter of mercury. But hydrostatic pressure here is 40 and here it is maybe 15. So along the capillary length, it is the hydrostatic pressure which mainly changes. In the beginning of the capillaries, hydrostatic pressure is more, more than osmotic pressures or oncotic pressure. At the end of the capillaries, hydrostatic pressure is less than the oncotic pressure of proteins. So what really happens that all the capillaries on their arterial ends, they are allowing the fluid to go out to take the oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, amino acids and many things to the cells. And on the venous ends of the capillaries, right, fluid is coming back to circulatory system, right, to bringing the waste product. So what's really happening all over your body? That in every tissue, fluid is coming out of capillaries, washing the cells, giving service to the cells, providing the nutrients, removing the waste product, going back from the venous end of the capillaries. Am I clear? Now. In our patient, there is significant injury to the glomerular structures and they have been heavy protein urea and due to heavy protein urea, patient develop hypoproteinemia and when proteins level become significantly low, then osmotic pressure in the capillaries becomes so less that on the arterial end of the capillaries, extra fluid is leaking out and on the venous end of the capillary, reclaiming of the fluid by the circulatory system is poor. So excessive fluid accumulate in interstitial spaces and that adds to the situation which is called edema. And because this happens all over the body, we call it generalized edema. And severe generalized edema is called anasarca. Severe generalized edema is called anasarca. <coughs> so you understand that after 
heavy protein urea, you develop hypoproteinemia, especially hypoalbuminemia, and that clinically translate into what? Generalized edema, a special point. Edema of the renal system, especially edema we develop due to protein losing nephropathies, initially start around the eyes and then face, then it spreads over all the body. So we say edema of renal origin usually start or initiate as periorbital edema. And later on it will become all over the body and it, this edema will be more in the dependent part of the body. Why it starts, uh, why it is more in the periorbital region? Raise your hand, who can tell me? Mechanism of edema you know that there is less osmotic pressure due to low plasma proteins so fluid is excessively lost from vascular compartment to interstitial compartment and edema is developing all over the body who will tell me why in periorbital area edema is more answer is very simple. have you heard of this thing or never heard you must have heard somewhere or you will hear that renal edema if someone patient come and he say daily in the morning when wake up there's too much swelling around the eyes and then on face you must start suspecting or you have to rule out the urinary losses of proteins okay let me tell you actually tissue here is very loose skin is very poorly attached with the underlying tissue you know you can take it up right but can you take skin from here up you cannot here it is tightly held so if capillaries are leaking here can they build enough pressure to push it away no, but here because it's loosely attached, a little increase excessive fluid will swell up without building a pressure in the tissue. So more and more fluid will keep on accumulating. Could you understand it? That this connective tissue, it is where the skin, it is very loosely held with underlying tissue. So when capillaries leak here, fluid come out, but because this tissue will move forward, it will accommodate the extra fluid. It will accommodate extra edema, edema fluid without raising the local pressure. So more fluid will come. So this area will become edematous earlier. This is one of the very important clinical point related with the edema of renal system. Is that right? Periorbital edema. Secondly, I told you this edema will be all over the body. And this edema will be pitting edema or non-pitting edema. You have a concept of pitting and non-pitting edema or no concept? Okay, let me tell you. I will just uh, try to give you the concept of pitting and non-pitting. These three very simple diagram. It's a side discussion from our lecture. But let's suppose this is capillary. This is arterial end. This is venous end. Again, this is capillary network, arterial end and venous end. These are three patient. Patient A, patient B, patient C. Now. Normally what happens, you know it, hydrostatic pressure is high pushing the fluid out and osmotic pressure is pulling the fluid back and in this way uh, fluid is being added from the capillaries continuously to the interstitium and taken back. Is that right? In first patient, in the first patient, patient A, there is increased hydrostatic pressure. Due to some reason, hydrostatic pressure becomes very very high. If pressure in the capillaries become very high, then leakage of the fluid will be too much. Leakage of the fluid will be too much. Now fluid is extra filtered because of the high pressure, but endothelial cells, endothelial cells have normal permeability. Only the pressure dynamics are changed. Is that right? Now, when fluid normally leak out, a little amount of protein also come here but this little amount of protein cannot be pulled back normally right now in your body wherever the fluid is filtering out with that fluid a very little amount of plasma proteins also leak out into interstitial area but this plasma protein cannot be sucked back by the capillary system but nature does not allow these plasma protein to accumulate here progressively these plasma protein are drained by the lymphatic system and lymphatic in the end drain into 
wins. In this way, in spite of the fact that capillaries do lose a small amount of proteins, these small amount of proteins do not accumulate into tissues, they are drained by lymphatic system. Am I clear to everyone? Now, we come to the first patient, high hydrostatic pressure, excessive fluid come here. Now, lymphatic system is working well, so fluid is coming here too much, but do you think proteins will accumulate with the fluid here? No. Is that clear? Now we come to the patient number two. In this case, hydrostatic pressure is normal. Problem is with oncotic pressure. Plasma proteins are less and osmotic pressure is less. In this case, also the fluid will be filtered. Will be normal or more than normal? Fluid which is filtered is more than normal. Right? But do you think excessive plasma proteins are filtered? They are normally filtered. But here lymphatics are also working. So, if lymphatics are functional in patient B also, even if small protein which is leaking, it will be drained. So, it means edema formation is patient in patient A as well as in patient B. In patient A, edema formation is due to excessive hydrostatic pressures. In patient B, uh, edema formation is due to reduced oncotic pressures. But in both cases, whatever small proteins are filtered, they are successfully drained by lymphatics. So mainly fluid accumulates. And this fluid, right, th this will be, some of it will be drained by lymphatics, but usually there is so much fluid that it overwhelms the lymphatic drainage system. Now we come to the third patient. In the third patient, hydrostatic pressure is normal. Hydrostatic pressure is normal. Even oncotic pressures are normal. Do you think patient can develop the edema now? Can patient develop by some mechanism edema now? Yes. That is by blockage of lymphatics. Lymphatics eventually drain into venous system here. Now, if there is some disease which has blocked the lymphatic system, for example, some parasites or lymphatics are blocked by the cancer cells or lymphatics are blocked by the fibrotic process, inflammatory process, by any reason. If lymphatics of the system are not, tissue are not working, the small amount of proteins which leak out, they cannot be drained. Over the months and years, those very small amount of proteins keep on accumulating. And when these proteins will accumulate pathologically here, which were supposed to be drained by lymphatics and these proteins will increase the osmotic pressure here and hold a lot of fluid. And whatever fluid is coming out, all of it is supposed to go back, but a small percentage of the fluid will be sticking to proteins, held by the proteins. So here edema will be formed, but this edema in patient C is different than the edema in patient A and B. What is the difference? The difference is that here edema fluid is held tightly with infiltrated proteins. Now, if you press this tissue with finger, here is only fluid. When you press with the finger, fluid is displaced. Edema fluid is displaced, right? So, you will be producing a pit here. With the finger, you can produce a pit here. So this is called pitting edema. This is called pitting edema. In the same way, in patient number B, again if with the finger you uh, press that tissue against some bone, edematous tissue, with little 30 second pressure, what really happens? Fluid is displaced. And significant because fluid is not held here with anything, so it will be displacing from that pressure under the finger. And this will be also pitting edema. But if someone has edema due to lymphatic obstruction, fluid is held tightly with the deposited proteins. With the finger, if you press, can you produce significant pit? No. So such edema is called non-pitting edema. It is, this concept is clinically very, very important. Let me tell you a very classical example. Let's suppose there are two sisters who are having breast cancer. It's very unfortunate. But anyway. 
and unfortunately cancer breast cancer has gone advanced and both of them develop swelling in the arm both of them develop swelling in the arm in one sister you press the edema fluid and pit is produced and in other sister edema of the arm is non pitting what's the difference both have breast cancer in first case probably breast cancer cells have obstructed the veins and when ve ve draining veins are obstructed or compressed what happens that blood is going to the arm through the arteries through capillaries fluid is coming out but because veins are blocked so hydrostatic pressure in capillaries goes up and she develop edema due to increase hydrostatic pressure as cancer cells are uh, blocking the veins or compressing the veins cancer mass is that right or a cancer, a cancer infiltrated lymph node may be compressing or clamping a vein so she will develop pitting edema the second unfortunate sister what happened with her that breast cancer cells have gone to the lymph node and lymphatics and her arm lymphatics are not draining well so she is accumulating progressively proteins in the she is progressively accumulating the proteins in the interstitial fluids of the arm and osmotic pressure in interstitial fluid become high and extra fluid is held there and she develops what type of edema non pitting edema am i clear any question up to this so what i was talking about edema of the renal losses of proteins right edema of renal losses of protein yes please you have a question Yeah. Right. He was just asking that uh, if a female who was having breast cancer, then he develop edema of the arm, non-pitting. It means that lymphatic metastases are there. Answer is yes. Uh, swelling of arm in a patient with breast cancer is an ominous sign. She is going to very advanced stage of the disease. I will teach you some day breast cancer. All right. Let's come back. So we were talking about that. What is happening? Heavy protein urea. Proteins level could not be maintained in spite of the compensatory effort by the liver. Hypoproteinemia, generalized edema, especially starting with periorbital region, and generalized edema is all over the body. So we call it anasarca, but it is more in the dependent area. Eventually, if patient is all the day mobile, it will be more in the leg. If patient is uh, lying in the bed, more in the back, depending upon right. Gravity will distribute the edema as well. This is one thing. Secondly, these patients have more mechanisms of edema also. Tell me one thing, that this patient who is losing protein here and developing hypoproteinemia here and losing the fluid to the what? Tissue spaces. So blood volume in these patients will be less than normal or more than normal blood volume in a patient with this disease is less than normal or more than normal yes this is less than normal because all the body is edematous water everywhere but not in circulation because from where the edema fluid came out of circulation is that right so the blood volume is less when blood volume is less do you think renal perfusion will be more or less and if renal perfusion is less kidneys start producing extra amount of renin so in these patients another mechanism which is activated is renin angiotensin aldosterone excess system primary mechanism of edema is hypoproteinemia but secondary mechanisms will be triggered then so what really happens in these patients that as generalized edema become more and volume of the blood in the circulatory system become less kidney may develop hypoprotein hypo perfusion so reduced blood, blood flow to the kidney will trigger the renin production and you know the renin in the blood will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin wrong renin will convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 1 will be converted by angiotensin converting enzyme in the lungs into angiotensin 2 
angiotensin 2 can constrict the vessels by in so increase hydrostatic pressure so bring more edema secondly angiotensin 2 will act on zona glomerulosa of adrenal cortex and adrenal cortex will release aldosterone and aldosterone will go to the principal cells of the nephron and reabsorb extra amount of sodium and water so sodium and water is held in the body so kidney strongly staunchly hold salt and water in the body this salt and water which is unduly held in the body will add to the blood volume right it is in a way kidney is trying to compensate the low blood volume but this extra salt and water which is returned to the circulation circulation cannot hold within its own chambers why circulation cannot hold because it has low proteins so this retained salt and water will again leak into tissues because because of hypoproteinemia kidney try to compensate by retaining salt and water but because circulation is poor in protein so this salt and water cannot be retained in circulation and it also adds further to the edema then what happened during all this blood become hemodiluted or hemoconcentrated blood will become hemoconcentrated of course out of the blood fluid is going into tissue so remaining blood become concentrated so patient blood or plasma osmolality will be more or less more. more so blood will become hyper or smaller blood will become in these patients hyper or smaller and this hyper or smaller blood when it will pass through the hypothalamus there are some areas in hypothalamus remember hypothalamus is in central nervous system so there are some areas in hypothalamus which have osmoreceptors they have special neurons which sense the blood osmolality as soon as blood osmolality become high those osmoreceptors trigger the release of ADH antidiuretic hormone ADH rush to the nephron and last part of the nephron under the influence of ADH retains further water and this further retained water cannot be held in circulation again leak into edema you are understanding what's happening so the multiple secondary mechanisms of edema formation are also activated so patient really develops very very severe edema is that right he develops severe edema so what patient has developed up to now let's make a triangle that patient has developed problem number one was heavy protein urea that led to what hypo yes proteinemia and that led to what generalized edema is it difficult to understand it's too easy like kid's story isn't it you lose the heavy proteins proteins become less here it cannot hold the water so water goes out then remaining blood gets hemoconcentrated so ADH come remaining blood flow to kidney become less renin angiotensin aldosterone system comes is it difficult it's dangerously easy isn't it now meanwhile our funny liver is trying to compensate it is making more and more proteins when it is making more albumin and globulin unfortunately it also makes more lipoproteins when liver in pump up its protein synthesis mechanisms it start producing unfortunately those proteins also in excessive amount which are concerned with the lipids lipoproteins are produced excessively so lipid system is now normal or disturbed disturbed so in a practical way we can say when liver is synthesizing excessive proteins lipoproteins are there with the lipoproteins lipids are there so patient develop hyper lipidemia this is the next thing the hypoproteinemia triggers the liver and liver will start producing eventually right and the result will be that patient will develop hyper lipidemia which lipids will go up LDL will go up intermediate density lipoproteins will go up 
very low density VL DL will go up triglycerides will not be cleared they will be going up do you think these are good news for the patient no, no and if this disease become chronic patient will develop more cardiac problems than coronary artery events and other atherosclerosis related problems will be there and the worst thing which will happen all these bad lipids going up and some patient HDL will go down so we don't call it hyperlipidemia because some lipids are going up and other are going down even the total lipids go up especially plasma cholesterol goes up some people call it just dyslipidemias right but for practical purpose you must remember that there is hyperlipidemia sometimes this hyperlipidemia is so severe that if you take the venous sample of the blood and put into a tube you will find that number one their blood is darker than other people because it is hemo concentrated and number two at the top of the tube at the top of the blood you will find lot of yellow color material what is that floating lipids I have seen this thing myself right that when you are taking the sample lipids come at the top is that right so so severe hyperlipidemia develops when so severe hyperlipidemia develops then not only proteins leak lipid also start leaking what starts leaking so patient develop with all this thing one more feature and that is yes lipid lipid urea so primary problem was just heavy protein losses so heavy protein losses that liver could not maintain the plasma protein levels so resulting into hyperproteinemia leading to generalized edema right by primary mechanisms and activation of activation of secondary mechanisms which may be multiple secondary mechanisms with that hyperlipidemia and eventually translating into lipidurea meanwhile you know don't forget these funny cells they are so stupid they eat whatever they find so previously they were eating the proteins and now they will take a big chunks on lipids they become full of lipids and they will become loaded with fat globules and of course do you think this cell will be now very healthy no it's like a obese man so what happens these cells become dysfunctional and shut down and appear into urine so in the urine you may find some cells with a big fat globule we call it fat oval bodies what do we call them fat oval bodies what are those these are the sprachymal convoluted tubular cells loaded with the fat shed into urine am i clear no problem up to this whole this picture is called nephrotic syndrome nephrotic syndrome all this thing which happened to the patient number 3 is nephrotic syndrome so how do you define now nephrotic syndrome nephrotic syndrome is a clinical pathological condition which develop when there is significant damage to the glomeruli which is leading to heavy protein urea heavy protein urea cutoff point is in adult 3.5 grams per day right and that is associated with hypoproteinemia generalized edema hyperlipidemia and even lipid urea so we just say patient has nephrotic syndrome let's suppose abdul you come here please don't uh, focus on his pants right now so this suppose we just suppose that this person has nephrotic syndrome is that right he must have a lot of edema he will have some more problems also not only this once I put the okay we'll talk the other problems later once I put the diagnosis that this patient has nephrotic syndrome do you think diagnosis is really complete or not no. it is not complete why it is not complete if I say this is a patient of nephrotic syndrome still you don't know what damage the kidney do you know nephrotic syndrome only tell you one thing this is a patient who has so much damage to his glomeruli that nephrotic range protein urea is there 
now in the discussion I will not call heavy protein urea this heavy protein urea which lead to the whole this clinical pathological condition good nephrologist will call this patient has nephrotic range protein urea and patient number two patient number two he had also protein urea but maybe it was only two grams per day and he did not develop generalized edema he did not develop significant hypoproteinemia he did not develop hyper general uh, hyperlipidemia or lipid urea so second patient cannot be called nephrotic so difference in second and third was that second patient has protein urea which is less than the nephrotic range so we say what what type of protein urea is this sub nephrotic range protein urea sub nephrotic range protein urea and what is this nephrotic range protein urea is that right i am clear just telling you that patient has nephrotic syndrome does not complete the diagnosis you just know that there is damage to the glomeruli but you don't know what thing is damaging that what are the what is really change histological and immunofluorescent changes in kidney what are the immunological changes in the body we don't know what triggered this damage 10 patient with nephrotic syndrome and each one may have a different cause of and different mechanism of damage to the glomeruli so we say that nephrotic syndrome is just a clinical phase of glomerular injury it is a phase but you don't know what's behind it's just a phase showing you that there is some glomerular damage going on the the simple these are what what I'm discussing with you I'm discussing with, with you the clinical presentation and clinical faces and clinical manifestations of glomerular injury that with the slightest glomerular injury the clinical presentation will be or biochemical presentation the urine will be selective protein urea if there's more injury plus two injury you get non-selective protein urea but if you don't have generalized edema or hyperproteinemia or hyperlipidemia or lipid urea then you do not have nephrotic syndrome and we say this protein urea is sub nephrotic range and in this case we say protein urea is so heavy that it has turned the whole patient pathophysiology into nephrotic picture so this is a patient with nephrotic syndrome now you understand the whole nephrotic syndrome that there is significant damage and result is heavy protein urea, hypoproteinemia, generalized edema, hyperlipidemia and lipid urea then there is more to this thing actually not only albumin leak in nephrotic some other small molecule of weight proteins also leak down for example one of the very small molecule of weight protein is transferrin what is that? transferrin and if nephrotic syndrome lasts longer I told you different patient have a different reason of nephrotic syndrome so some patient may develop nephrotic syndrome only for short time and some patient may have nephrotic syndrome for years and years if you have nephrotic syndrome for long time you are losing the transferrin transferrin is a protein which transfer iron in the blood so iron handling in the body will be normal or abnormal abnormal, abnormal. So patient may develop iron deficiency anemia but only in the chronic cases of nephrotic then another protein which leaks down the system is antithrombin 3 this is a protein which prevent the undue thrombogenesis in the blood it is against the thrombin system antithrombin 3 is a thrombin cutter it destroys some of the activated coagulation factor this protein is normally present in us it's a very small molecular weight, weight protein so it it is lost into urine and when this protein is lost into urine for a long time blood is losing anticoagulant proteins so blood will become procoagulant so patient will develop thrombosis more readily am I clear? right so many of the patient with, thromb uh, with nephrotic syndrome develop thrombosis in the veins especially renal vein thrombosis so these patients have thrombotic tendency one of the reason for thrombotic tendency only one reason is there are multiple reason of thrombogenesis but one reason in these patient of thrombogenesis is loss of anticoagulant proteins into urine and then there are more reasons what are the reasons 
that these patients undergo repeated thromb thrombus formation. Number one is loss of anti thrombin 3 or other anticoagulant proteins. Number two may be due to hyperlipidemia, hyperlipidemia, lipid incorporate and disturb the platelet membrane. And you know when platelet membranes are disturbed, they love to stick to each other. So thrombogenesis. Then high lipids also disturb the membrane of endothelium. When endothelial membranes are disturbed, that also becomes thrombogenic. And then of course, highly concentrated blood, hemoconcentration. Blood flow is fast or slow through the veins. Stasis. Stasis. Further adding to thrombo. Genesis. So there are multiple reasons why these patients develop a tendency for thrombogenesis. And story does not end up there. Some very important, some more very important proteins also leak down. What are those? Maybe some of the immunoglobulins. But more importantly, low molecular weight complements are lost into urine. And if low molecular weight complement proteins are lost into urine, do you think if patient has less complement factors in the blood, patient can fight with the infection effectively? No. no. Because antibodies with complement are the real fighting machine against many bacteria. So these patients have low chances of infection or high chances of infection? High chances of, high chances of infection. Many of them die due to infections. Right? Maybe nephrotic syndrome does not kill, but complications of nephrotic syndrome kill. For example, when complements are lost into urine, patient's immune system is disturbed and weak, these patients specially develop pneumococcal infection because we need complements to kill the pneumococci because they are capsulated and we need C3B as option N if you have studied the complement system. You know there is something called C3B that help the bacteria to stick with the neutrophil and macrophage and facilitate the phagocytosis of bacteria, those things are lost. Right? So patient has increased thrombotic tendency, patient has increased tendency for infections, is that right? And another thing, usually these patients have frothy urine. Why their urine is frothy? Low, high protein level. Proteins in the urine make the urine frothy. Is that right? What about the nephrotic? syndrome. Do you have any question up to this? Let's go to now patient number 4 and do a little more injury. Is that right? And see what happened. You already know our patient number 1, he had non-selective protein, selective protein urea, albumin urea. Next patient had non-selective protein urea but less than nephrotic range. Third patient has heavy protein urea of the nephrotic range. Let's come to the next patient. In this patient, suppose this is your circulatory system, this is his renal system. In this patient, patient number 4, let's suppose there is more severe injury, plus 4. It is so severe injury that inflammatory lesions, severe inflammatory lesions develop in glomeruli. Glomeruli become loaded with neutrophils, they become loaded with macrophages and severe inflammatory lesions form in glomeruli. Yes, you have a question? Yes, uh, but regarding the, the subnephrotic range, why only low molecular proteins will be lost in the nephrotic range instead of uh, non-selective? No, this will be also non-selective. Correct, but on stage two? Secondly, listen, listen. Actually, some nephrotic patient have only albumin loss and some nephrotic patient have both losses. Right? It depends on. If damage is just increase number of pores but not the size of the pores, you develop, you develop albumin urea. And if it is so many pores that total albumin last is more than 3.5 grams, nephrotic will come. But another nephrotic in which not only increase number of pores is there but there is increase number of, increase size of pores. So he will develop non-selective protein urea. Am I clear? Yes. So listen, this concept that selective protein urea 
it does not tell nephrotic will be there or not. Selective protein urea only tell that there are some excessive small pores and albumin is coming. But if albumin is less than 3.5 gram, sub nephrotic. If it, albumin in the urine is more than 3.5 grams, this is nephrotic. Now listen another patient. He has few extra pores but they are very large. So he has albumin and globulin. So we say non-selective protein urea but less than nephrotic. But the same pores become more non-selective protein urea into nephrotic. Is that right? So nephrotic syndrome patient has just heavy protein urea. It may be selective, it may be non-selective. Later on in the lecture I will tell you when nephrotic syndrome is due to minimal change glomerulopathy, it is selective protein urea. And when nephrotic syndrome is due to membranoproliferative disease, it becomes non-selective. Because in minimal change glomerulopathy, there are some cytokines which just neutralize the charges, negative charges. Pore size is not increased. So when all the glomerular basement membrane negative charge disappear, heavy albumin start leaking because that is no more repelled. Because normal size of the pores, normal size of the pore should allow the albumin. But normally albumin does not go down due to repulsion by the charges. So minimal chain disease pathology, just there are some cytokines and some biochemical substances which neutralize all the negative charges in 2.5 million glomerular basement membranes. And everywhere heavy albumin loses. But when I tell you another disease like focal segmental glomerular nephritis, I will teach you later, don't be confused. Or membranous glomerulopathy or uh, membranoproliferative glomerulopathy, then big pores are formed. Not only pore number is increased, but size is also increased. So you will have nephrotic with non-selective protein urea. Am I really clear to you? People are teaching myself. You are understanding something. Okay, you are looking angry. You understand it? Okay. Now, now listen. No, some people after my lecture become angry. Most of them become happy. They become angry. They say, why we did not understand before? And I never ask, they are angry with whom? With themselves or with someone else? Anyway, let's come back. This is the next patient. Here I say, there are truly very severe injury to the glomerulus. There are severe inflammatory reactions going on in glomeruli. And even glomerular membrane somewhere having big holes. This time, of course, albumin will come down, isn't it? With that, globulin will also come down. Am I right? Every type of plasma protein is coming down. And with that, even RBCs will come down. Now picture will change. Now picture will change. It's a very critical point of understanding where we stand now. That there is really big damage and there are inflammatory lesions, big inflammatory lesions going on there. Lot of antibodies, maybe complements, lot of neutrophils, macrophages, platelets sticking there, lot of cellular element. Pathology is really advanced in this patient. So he has albumin urea with global injuria or non-selective protein urea. With that he has hematuria. What this patient has developed? Hematuria. Especially in the urine, you will find a very, in the, you know, whenever RBCs are or blood in urine, we say there is hematuria. But every hematuria is not coming from glomeruli. Even if your urethra is damaged, you develop hematuria. If your urinary bladder is damaged, you develop hematuria. But this is the hematuria of glomerular region. This is one of the very dangerous hematuria. Because this tells there is something seriously wrong with your glomeruli. Now how you really know that this particular hematuria is coming from the glomeruli? How you differentiate this hematuria from other hematuria? Very simple. Have you seen stars? I am not talking about movie stars. Stars in the sky. They are pointed edges. Actually any RBC, RBC which has to slip through this and come all the way down, do you think this RBC will have normal shape? It will have some star shaped spikes and these starry RBCs, when you find this type of RBCs into urine, we think they are coming from glomeruli. Is that right? So RBCs into urine, 
which have been pushed through squeezing and all dysmorphic RBCs, the morphology is disturbed. So you find RBCs which are like this. They are coming from where? All the way from glomeruli and they squeeze their way through very much disrupted membrane. Secondly, when RBCs really leak in heavy number, they produce a traffic jam in where they produce a traffic jam? Not on the roads, on the tubular system. So what really happens? If this is your tubule and RBCs get stuck on the way and when these RBCs are stuck and they are being pushed, so these RBCs are compressed against each other and they are held together by some proteins. Some proteins holding the group of RBCs which are pushed by first they accumulated they produced a block here, then fluid accumulated and pushed it forward. When these RBCs group will come out, right, this RBCs will making microscopic cylindrical, microscopic cylinders. This cylinder is like the cast of, cast of inner lumen. So when these Groups of RBCs appear into urine, we say patient is showing RBC cast. RBC cast is a dangerous thing. It means RBCs are coming from the top, glomeruli, and they have been heavy protein urea and they have been stuck into what? Tubule and then they have been pushed by the fluid and they become compressed and they make a cast of the lumen of the renal tubule and we call them RBC cast. So patient is now developing, not only albuminuria, global injuria, he is developing our hematuria with dysmorphic RBCs into urine and red cell cast. You have heard of this term? Right. Do you think under these circumstances when glomeruli are swollen and inflamed, lot of glomeruli are infiltrated with inflammatory cells, do you think blood can easily pass through glomeruli? No. Even injured endothelial cells may develop the platelet plugs. So total blood flow through kidney will become less or more? Less. Normally during inflammation blood flow become more. But when glomeruli are severely inflamed, glomeruli swell up and they become loaded and clogged by the inflammatory cells. So blood cannot pass through that. So you will make more GFR or less GFR? Glomerular filtration will be more or less? Less. For when glomerular filtration start going down, now here the difference from nephrotic patient, the glomerular filtration in this patient is going down. So total urine formation will be normal or less? Less. less. And when urine formation per 24 hour is less than 400 ml, we say patient has oligoguria. So this patient along with this thing develop oleg Urea due to reduced GFR, they develop oligurea. These things were not so severe in nephrotic patient. Things are getting worse. Total urine amount is less, and because now here is a very important point: because the total filtration is less, so total loss of protein will be less than nephrotic. This is a very very fine point to understand. Listen with your both ears lesson. Here there was significant formation of filtration. So with filtration a lot of proteins were filtered and coming down. Here injury is more. So you, a simp, every student may think protein urea should become more but actually protein urea become less. Why protein urea is less? Because Leon the so advanced that filtration is total filtration is reduced. When total filtration is reduced the total amount of filtered protein is also reduced. And so, in these patients, albumin urea and global urea is less than the nephrotic patients. Or, we can say another thing. Patient come to you with nephrotic syndrome. Unfortunately, his disease become advanced. So, patient who was only nephrotic, having generalized edema, heavy protein urea, hypoproteinemia, gradually his edema start becoming less, hypoproteinemia become less. Protein urea become less. Maybe a simple doctor become very happy. 
and he is not looking for something dangerous start appearing in the urine rbc is an rbc is cast so actually patient is getting better or worse? worse patient is getting worse you are intelligent patient is getting worse you should be only happy when edema become less you should be only happy when edema is reducing when protein urea is reducing hypoproteinemia is less and when dangerous things are not coming then this is a good news but if all these nephrotic features are reducing and hematuria is developing rbc cast are developing dysmorphic rbc are developing oligouria is developing and when gfr is less do you think waste product from the blood will be re removed properly no so urea and creatinine start accumulating in the blood urea and goes up and creatinine goes up so blood biochemistry is now further disturbed and in the blood when urea and creatinine are rising this biochemical disturbance of the blood is given a special name what is that name azotemia the term is called azotemia so patients start developing yes azotemia so look just severe inflammation severe inflammation led to reduce gfr reduced gfr led to leak urea into urine and less gfr reduces the capability of the kidney to eliminate the waste product and patient develop azotemia and of course blood flow to kidney is really dangerously reduced so renin mechanism is slightly increased or powerfully increased powerfully increased so very powerful stimulation of renin angiotensin aldosterone excess not only salt and water is retained but you know one of the most powerful vasoconstrictor is angiotensin 2 so patient develop hypertension so patient is now developing hypertension so do you think patient is getting better or worse worse so now look at it one patient who was nephrotic going to advanced stage initially he had heavy protein urea then hypo proteinemia and generalized edema unfortunately underlying mechanism of injury became amplified so inflammatory lesions develop in glomeruli that reduces the glomerular flow so protein losses become less hypoproteinemia become less severe of course then proteins level are better in the blood generalized edema become less but actually a dangerous black triangle is appearing a deadly triangle what is that heavy damage to glomeruli so patient is developing hema churia specially dysmorphic rbc's dysmorphic rbc's and rbc cast with that patient is developing oligo urea with azotemia and patient develop hypertension now it is no more nephrotic it is no more nephrotic now it is nephritic what is this thing nephritic syndrome so what concept we really made that is the damage to glomeruli we keep on changing the face is that right that very little damage and you develop albumin urea a little more damage you develop albumin urea with non globulin urea so non-selective protein urea heavy damage you may develop heavy selective protein urea or heavy non-selective protein urea eventually precipitating in the formation of nephrotic situation further inflammatory lesions leading to converting nephrotic into nephritic or patients start directly as nephritic and then the next patient may develop more aggressive injury what will happen we'll talk about after the break right so in the previous lecture we were discussing about that how different degree of and different type of injury to glomeruli can produce different type of clinical presentations right we have discussed few clinical presentations and more I will discuss now let's recap a little bit that glomerular injury 
the heading should be glomerular glomerular injury right not one glomerular multiple glomerular of course and you can say degree of injury plus one and what was there yes you will tell me the mechanism that was leading to selective selective protein urea or other name for selective protein urea was albumin urea then we said there was second more injury and that was leading to yes non selective protein urea but it may be sub nephrotic range sub nephrotic range right then further damage heavy protein urea which may be selective or which may be non selective and this will eventually lead to nephrotic syndrome because it's nephrotic range more than 3.5 grams per day wrong then we come to the next situation and injury has become more severe and producing severe inflammatory lesions in glomeruli so in this case you have to always remember here was a cold triangle and this cold triangle was in the nephrotic cold triangle was heavy protein urea with hypoproteinemia leading to generalized edema with that there were two things hyperlipidemia and hyperlipid urea now in very severe injury this cold triangle will shrink and a hot triangle will form and this hot triangle which is more deadly situation even though there may be some degree of protein urea there may be some degree of hypoproteinemia there may be some degree of generalized edema but the more dangerous things which will develop in uh, nephritic syndrome they are high blood pressure hypertension oligosuria with azotemia and of course hematuria with dysmorphic rbcs and rbc cast is that right now we go to the next situation that let's suppose there is injury which is very very intense very intense injury so severe injury it really made multiple big disruptions in glomerular basement membrane let's suppose injury was so severe that glomerular basement membrane had big disruptions and there is severe inflammation of the vessels ruptured now in this case of course it's easy to understand that albumin will come down isn't it globulins will also come down rbcs will also come down rbc which are dysmorphic and rbc cast will also come down right but actually in this particular case lot of fibrin leaks down fibrin molecules and fibrin molecules are accumulated here and breakdown product of fibrin molecule are very very stimulating to the epithelial cells for the growth again listen if there is very very severe disruptive injury right then lot of fibrin come down and it break down into product which act as a growth product for epithelial cell plus fibrin attract macrophages so lot of macrophages come from this area to this area so local epithelial cells are proliferating with that lot of macrophages are migrating to this area with very severe intense injury and with that of course there are platelets there other macrophages are there mesangial cells are activated also with this injury and all these cells producing lot of growth factors you are understanding and this very concentrated growth factors present over here all these epithelial cells will start proliferating and within these proliferating epithelial cells there will be lot of 
macrophages which are also proliferating and within few weeks you will find that whole the urinary space is full of cells. Do you think now this urinary space can work well? Again, extremely severe injury, lot of growth factor, some coming from breakdown of the fibrin, some from platelet derived growth factor, some coming from the macrophages, some growth factor coming from mesangial cells and under the influence of all these growth factors and other inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory products, there is lot of migration of macrophages, monocytes from the vascular compartment to urinary space plus local epithelial cells proliferate and they make these cellular crescents. They make these cellular crescent. Some people call this situation crescent glomerulopathy or crescent glomerulonephritis. But we are talking about the clinical presentation, not histology. How this patient will come to you? This patient will not come to you with early situations, rather because his glomeruli are getting blocked with these crescents, he will develop rapidly progressive, rapidly progressive loss of kidney function. What they are developing? Rapidly progressive loss of kidney function. And in this patient, of course, all these things of nephritic are there. All the problems related with nephritic are there. But at the top, so much urea, creatinine and other products are accumulated in the blood that clinical features of renal failure become apparent. And previously, what happened that there were biochemical dis disturbance in the blood. In case of nephritic, you remember urea and creatinine was accumulating in the blood. So that was azotemia. Azotemia means that due to reduced renal function, azotemia means due to reduced renal function or what is there? There is disturbed blood chemistry. But this situation is advanced. Blood chemistry is so much disturbed that signs and symptoms of renal failure appear. For example, potassium in the blood become very high and arrhythmias may start. Uremic pericarditis may develop. Uremic enteropathies may develop. Uremic, you can say, central nervous system features develop. Uremic frost may come on the skin. I want to know what is uremia. Yes. What is uremia? Yes, please. And look, all of you have heard the word uremia. So what is uremia? Don't tell me urine in blood. What is uremia? Nephrology. Very simple. When, listen, when due to renal dysfunction, blood chemistry is so much disturbed, the signs and symptoms of failure appear. We say azotemia has been converted into uremia. So what is the difference in azotemia and uremia? The only thing is, as if I say this patient has only azotemia, no uremia, it means his blood chemistry is disturbed due to renal dysfunction, but not enough to produce signs and symptoms of renal failure. But when due to reduced renal function, blood chemistry is so much disturbed that patient develop multiple clinical features of renal failure, then that syndrome is called uremia. So this patient will develop uremia or simply we say this patient will develop renal failure he will develop renal failure and this renal failure develop in a short time or very long time in a short time with heavy injury very short time kidney failed rapidly progressive every week they are getting more and more advanced failure right so there are many names for this condition right they call it crescent glomerulonephritis or glomerulopathy or some people call it rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. The glomerulonephritis is becoming very rapidly progressive. But clinically, this patient will come with acute renal failure. So acute renal failure because it is over the few days and weeks. Kidney function fails significantly. So we say patient is suffering with acute renal failure. So how many phases of 
glomerular injury you know glomerular injury may produce selective protein urea or it may produce non selective protein urea even i did not mention sometimes few areas in glomerula are injured but big point yeah, big areas of injury patient may develop hematuria so hematuria is also one feature of somewhere here hematuria that there is severe injury to glomeruli but only few points so patient may develop only hematuria but if there are severe injury with lot of points patient will develop nephritic is that right and if there is severe injury very intense and very rapidly patient's clinical situation deteriorate and patient develop the by uh, altered biochemistry of blood as well as clinical feature of renal failure we say acute renal failure right but underlying problem may be like this and after that the last end stage kidney anyone listen now very carefully anyone who has glomerular injury moderate to severe but for long long time may be patient with nephrotic may be patient with nephritic or this may become prolonged any one of the injury either it is moderate injury or it is severe injury if it continues to glomeruli over the years what will happen when inflammatory cells and inflammation is there for very long time then inflammatory cell start producing growth factors inflammatory cells start producing growth factors especially for proliferation and activation of fibrocytes and fibroblast so regardless of whatever the original cause of injury originally patient may develop nephrotic or patient may develop nephritic or patient may develop rapidly progressive situation whatever he developed if it is not controlled and it goes over the years in all these patients who are becoming now chronic patients there may be significant activation of fibrocytes and fibroblast and they start laying down the collagen in glomeruli and glomeruli become collagenized do you think if they become fibrotic and collagenized will they work no and do you think you can reverse their function no so this progressive irreversible damage to glomeruli will eventually lead to chronic renal failure so chronic renal failure is a waste basket in which any one of them may come chronic nephrotic may come into this chronic nephrotic may come into this this never resolved may come into this right so some patient may come to you just with the chronic renal failure or we call it chronic glomerular nephritis and when you do biopsy or when you study the kidney you find that uh, renal cortices are shrunken renal glomeruli are fibrotic here you just find that all this is fibrotic and tubule is atrophied of course nothing is passing through that right so glomeruli fibrotic they don't use the word fibrotic nephrologists use the word that glomeruli are hyalinized hyalinized hyalinization of glomeruli right so what really happens that anyone who is having injury to glomeruli it may be mild or it may be moderate or it may be severe but if it lasts for too long then inflammatory cells start producing growth factors and if those growth factors severely stimulate the fibrocytes and fibroblast process then glomeruli are replaced by fibrotic points right and when fib uh, glomeruli become fibrotic their dependent nephron tubules become atrophied and we say there is chronic renal failure am i clear and any one of earlier situation can go into chronic renal failure and sometimes some patient may come with chronic renal failure and you don't know what was the original event right you may come across a patient who has chronic renal failure you do biopsy glomerular fibrotic you check out he is not hypertensive he is not diabetic maybe previously he developed some degree of glomerular disease and that was not properly diagnosed and may remain asymptomatic there are many patients who keep on having protein urea of subnephrotic range for many many years very mild injury but very prolonged injury eventually replacing the glomeruli with fibrotic thin 
So this concept clear? How these all things interlink with each other? Is that right? So here we will stop today. In the next lecture, what we will be discussing that in glomerular injury, what are the antigens which stimulate the injury? What are the immune mediated processes? Are they humoral or cell mediated? What are the immunological mechanisms of injury? Then immunological mechanism of injury, how they activate neutrophil, macrophage, complement system, a platelet system and eventually what type of histopathology and immunofluorescence changes come into kidney like minimal change of membranous glomerulonephritis or membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis or IgA nephropathy or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis all these things and eventually these things what type of clinical phases they are developing. So we have just discussed injury and clinical phases. We have not discussed why injury occurs how injury occurs and what changes in the glomeruli are brought into different type of injury. So that will be done next time. Class dismissed.